Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to begin by sharing a Prince quote from an interview for MTV in 1985. One thing I try to do with things that I direct is go for the different, the out of the norm, the avant purple, so to speak. Prince's fourth and final full-length feature film, 1990's Graffiti Bridge, was ahead of its time, an eclectic hybrid of musical theater aesthetics and cinematic techniques interspersed with performance pieces. Today I will argue that the film's genius lies precisely in what have been perceived by Prince's fans and film critics alike to be its two biggest weaknesses, its visual aesthetics and its unconventional structure, both of which skew more toward the art house movie musical than the traditional narrative cinema of its predecessor, 1984's Purple Rain. Using Rick Altman's classic genre study, The American Film Musical, as a framework, I will present Graffiti Bridge as an avant-purple parable of hope, a commentary on the angst of black youth in North Minneapolis, and a testament to the power of Prince's spiritual message, in which love, including self-love, love for one another, and love for God, is our saving grace. As a sequel to Purple Rain, it's much more effective than meets the eye. Altman posits that American film musicals blend semantic elements, such as settings, characters, and iconography, with syntactic elements, such as narrative structure and organization. Due largely to Prince's efforts to gain financial backing from Warner Brothers Pictures, the film changed from a more straightforward homage to the classic Hollywood musicals of Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire to a singular hybrid of cinematic narrative and choreographed musical performance, a stylistic blend of Prince's first two films, Purple Rain and Under the Cherry Moon, which were more story-driven, and his third film, Sign of the Times, in which the story takes a backseat to the performance elements. What began as a Broadway-inspired collaboration between Prince and its prospective leading lady Madonna eventually morphed into a quasi-sequel to the first film after Warner Brothers executives were not sold on Prince's original vision. Recall the various real-world settings of Purple Rain, both interior locations like First Avenue in the kids' bedroom, as well as exteriors like the lake in the woods of Henderson, Minnesota, which gave that film a naturalistic, expansive look and feel. In sharp contrast, the fabricated sets and set pieces in Graffiti Bridge, the fake water under the bulky bridge, and the outdoor scenes decorated with plastic plants and seemingly shot with Vaseline on the camera lens, make that film feel smaller and cheaper than what came before it. The self-contained artificial nature of the sequel's semantic elements inform both a public and critical perception of inferiority, since they run counter to the conventional expectation that sequels should always be bigger and better. The sets were all fake, Opine cast member Robin Power. They weren't real. Jerome Benton, who appeared in both films, admitted that, aesthetically, Purple Rain was more open. The syntactic organization of these semantic elements, the way the constructed sets and set pieces are integrated into the movie, creates a distinct aesthetic that's more evocative of a film stage production than a cinematic experience. This syntactic choice influences the narrative structure by confining the action to limited spaces, making Graffiti Bridge seem less dynamic, less coherent, and less accessible than Purple Rain. On the surface, the sequel lacks the larger-than-life quality that audiences almost subconsciously expect from the continuation of a cinematic story. I would argue, however, that this film's tonal and structural shifts 
away from the typical formulaic movie toward a more abstract, artsy aesthetic, make it more personal and intimate, and, by extension, more powerful and meaningful than a cookie-cutter narrative film. In the tradition of American film musicals, Graffiti Bridge uses choreographed performances as a means of nonverbal character development. Perhaps the most deliberate example of this is the love scene between the kid and Aura. Notably, it's intriguing that this scene is the only scene in the film shot entirely outdoors in natural daylight. This is symbolic of the impact that Aura's words, and indeed her very presence, have on the kid's mental and spiritual states. His heart and mind are emerging from the darkness, headed toward the light. This scene is visually oriented, accompanied by the song The Question of You, a song that presents a soul-searching story in which the narrator ponders the enigmatic nature of God and his own role in a supposed relationship with God, if and when he decides that such a relationship should exist. Quoting from the question of you, Shall I become naked? No image at all? Shall I remain upright? Or get down and crawl? All of the questions in my life will be answered when I decide which road to choose. What is the answer to the question of you? In a less conventional turn, the scene foregoes overt sexuality for sensual physicality. Gazing, touching, and a metaphorical interpretive dance conveying attraction, longing, and the search for mental and spiritual catharsis. As Altman notes, the choreography in film musicals transforms the visual spectacle into a language of its own. Compare this scene to another iconic dance in an American film musical, Gene Kelly's solo number, in Singing in the Rain. Kelly's joyous, free-spirited movements convey clarity and assuredness within the feeling of romantic bliss. In contrast, Prince's slow, introspective movements convey a feeling of hesitance, doubt, and uncertainty regarding not only the kid's relationship with Aura, but also his relationships with himself and with God. Altman states, Dance numbers and musicals often function as narrative devices, providing insight into a character's inner life and advancing the plot in ways that dialogue cannot. Devoid of spoken lines, the question of you scene is arguably a microcosm of one of the messages at the heart of Prince's entire body of work. Sexuality and spirituality are not mutually exclusive concepts. One always interacts with and informs the other. The choreography of this scene serves as a beautifully abstract commentary on this duality in human nature. The hybrid avant-purple genre in which it situates itself gives the film different levels of meaningful impact in the eyes of moviegoers and in the eyes of its creator, Prince. For viewers, the semantic elements of the musical performances, visual aesthetics, lyrics, and choreography, immerse them in Prince's artistic vision, bypassing traditional narrative exposition in favor of conveying emotions and thematic motifs. In a syntactic sense, the intertwining of musical performances within the narrative creates a rhythm that emphasizes the highs and lows of the characters, mirroring the structure of what Altman calls the dual focus narrative. The parallel storylines of the kid and his group, the New Power Generation, and their rivals, Morris Day and the Time, highlight their individual struggles as well as the general communal struggle within Seven Corners. Morris jockeying for control of Pandemonium, Glam Slam, The Clinton Club, and Melody Cool mirrors the kid jockeying for control of his own fatalistic thoughts, and over the fear that those thoughts may one day suffocate his will to keep living. 
For Prince, the musical performances in Graffiti Bridge allow him to express the internal struggles of his character, the kid, as he questions whether, like his father before him, he'll die by his own hand, ultimately succumbing to the karmic cycles created by the generational patterns of domestic violence that propel his quest for spiritual redemption and salvation. His struggle reflects many real-life issues faced by black youth from inner-city areas like North Minneapolis, such as systematic disadvantages, familial instability, and personal trauma. The kid's journey toward enlightenment and his efforts to break free from a repetitive cycle of suffering are symbolic of a broader narrative of resilience and hope within marginalized communities turning the film into a powerful parable of overcoming insurmountable odds and indestructible personal demons with the help of spiritual and communal support. Altman's concept of the utopian sensibility in American film musicals is crucial to the understanding of the kid's journey of spiritual redemption. Altman asserts that musicals often provide a sense of idealism and hope, offering audiences an escape from their realities through the portrayal of a better world in which characters often find a way to transcend their dark circumstances. The kid's triumph over his own personal trauma is the movie's central theme, reflected in the lyrics of the title track on the soundtrack album. And I quote, The love of a boy, the love of a girl, the love that comes from a warm heart in a cold, cold world. Everybody wants to find Graffiti Bridge, something to believe in, a reason to believe that there's a heaven above. As is the case with most of Prince's creative projects, Graffiti Bridge went over the heads of audiences at the time. In an interview a year after its release, he mused that the film was one of the purest, most spiritual, uplifting things I've ever done. Maybe it will take people 30 years to get it. That's a prophetic statement if there ever was one. Prince gave the masses an art film rather than a standard cinematic experience, and no one got it back then. In today's complex world, where the echoes of the Black Lives Matter movement still resonate in the wake of Trayvon Martin Freddie Gray and George Floyd, I believe Graffiti Bridge can, should, and will be better understood and appreciated through distance, time, and the lens of academic analysis. Thank you.